Hello and welcome to the third episode of the Backyard Space Show here on YouTube, brought to you by the Backyard Space Program on Facebook groups. Once again, I'm your host Kyle, and tonight we'll be continuing the how-to theme seen in our last two episodes and uh, delve deeper into the topic of uh, astrophotography. Last episode, we merely hinted at advanced topics, but if you've been following along, you're probably wondering what's next. You got a mount. You've got your mount and a telescope now. You've probably grabbed your DSLR or a simple AP camera, and now you're wondering what to do. So to, tonight we aim to address that question. Um, once again, uh, if you've got down the basics, you can move on to real astrophotography. Of course, you can still use your DSLR camera that we talked about last episode. Um, however, only tonight we'll only be covering AP cameras, uh, specifically CCD and CMOS uh, cameras, or SCMOS, uh, as well as the necessary software for running, as well as some processing techniques and tips to help, uh, help you create some uh, photos. Um, and again, you know, I apologize for the uh, late video. Um, of course, Christmas was going on, and um, you know, so we're pretty busy. And uh, you know, just some delays going on here and there. We've mentioned already on the uh, Facebook page. So, uh, anyways, thanks for bearing with it. Um, as usual, we're going to start with some news stories here. So. <clears throat> December 22nd, 2016, uh, non-science students enrolled in astrophotography classes created by scientists at the University of California, Riverside. The university reported a better understanding of how to use a telescope and camera and how to process images, according to a recently published paper about the class. In addition, after taking the classes, the students, most of whom were UC Riverside non-STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics majors, were eager to take up astrophotography as a hobby, opening the path to become future citizen scientists and amateur astronomers. Groups which historically have analyzed a lot of astronomical data and made numerous discoveries. Astrophotography is a great way to teach science in a visual and hands-on manner, says postdoctoral researcher in astrophysics Mario DeLeo Winkler. It also provides a way to break through the mathematical anxiety that many non-science majors experience. This is a great story as it pertains to what we are trying to do with BSP and with the show here, which is spread awareness about astrophotography as well as astronomy. Uh, to all people, not just those in science-related fields or hobbies, but those who have never even picked up a camera or a telescope before. Uh, more of this story can be read on its source on the University of California Riverside website. Uh, links will be provided in the description below on the YouTube uh, channel. So moving on. December 20th. In a recently published Nature Magazine article, CERN's Alpha Collaboration has announced the first measurement of a spectral line in an anti-hydrogen atom. This result, which was 20 years in the making, was achieved using a laser to observe the 1s-2s transition in anti-hydrogen. To within experimental limits, the Alpha Collaboration's results show that this transition is both identical in hydrogen and anti-hydrogen atoms, a condition required by the standard model. If these transitions were different, it would essentially break our current understanding of physics. This result was discovered at CERN's anti-proton decelerator uh, facility and has led to several of these breakthroughs in the characterization of antimatter. These results show just how far antimatter research has come at CERN. The Alpha Collaboration plans to further refine the precision of their findings in the future for more, even more robust testing of the standard model. More of this can be read over at uh, astronomy.com. Let's see, moving on to our last story. So, December 22nd, um, astronomynow.com reported on an image taken with X-ray data from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and the ROSAT telescope, which provided the purple color Infrared data from NASA's, NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, which provided the orange, and optical data from the Supercosmos Sky Survey, which provided the blue. 
made by the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope, which all were taken to form a gorgeous composite image, affectionately and seasonally dubbed the Cosmic Winter Wonderland. Located in our galaxy about three, uh, excuse me, 5,500 light years from Earth, NGC 6357 is actually a cluster of clusters, containing at least three clusters of young stars, including many hot, massive, luminous stars. Uh, the x-rays from Chandra and Rosat reveal hundreds of point sources, which are the young stars in the NG6357, as well as a diffuse x-ray emission from hot gas. There are bubbles or cavities that have been created by radiation and material blowing away from the surfaces of massive stars, plus supernova explosions. This object and others like it are known as an H2 region, which are created when the radiation from hot young stars strips away the electrons from the neutral hydrogen atoms and the surrounding gas to form clouds of ionized hydrogen, which is denoted scientifically as H2. This is a beautiful image here, um, captured by many different instruments on several different space telescopes, and it's pretty fitting, I guess, right here around the holidays. Uh, more of this can be read at astronomynow.com. So that's it for the news. Moving on. All right, now that we got the news out of the way, let's start tonight's episode and get right into it. Our topics, as mentioned, will cover a few of the CCD CMOS cameras you can use, as well as the software to go along with it, as well as some techniques and tips to help get you started in processing your newfound captured ions of ancient light, also known as image data. Alright, so CMOS, or officially known as Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor, cameras are the newer lines of image sensors and have their limitations. Um, CMOS sensors work by detecting light ions on the sensor space. Uh, so, um, basically, the front of the sensor, light comes in, it the ions um, basically come in and is read on each pixel individually. There's a register on each pixel. So they typically have rolling shutters, which uh, can be seen the most when shooting moving objects or things. Um, so basically, you know, they do have CMOS that have global shutters, um, which we'll explain in a minute. But rolling shutters is more typical of most uh, CMOS cameras. Um, CMOS are typically not cooled and work great as planetary cameras and auto guiders. So most of the CMOS uh, cameras you'll see are going to probably be auto guiding and planetary uh, based cameras. Most cameras like these serve both purposes. As a planetary camera when used with lenses or a telescope, you, it can allow you to capture amazing images of solar system objects and um, specifically of the planets and as an auto guider these small cameras can extend your shooting times greatly um, so with an auto guider you're not just relying on your mounts tracking uh, process but a uh, separate camera and software uh, watch a guide star uh, outside of the main camera's imaging area and if the software detects that that guide star moves you know even a micron of a pixel right or left it's going to send a signal through uh, the wire connecting it to the mount, telling the mount to slight, ever so slightly move one way or the other. So you're not just relying on the mount, which has a lot of periodic error. Um, so, <clears throat> let's see. So some cameras we recommend and use ourselves. Um, this is the QHY CCD. Okay, this is made by QHY. I don't know if you can see that. It's pretty hard to see the writing on it, but there's a little sensor down in here. That's a CMOS camera. And this uses the MT9M034 imaging sensor. This is a color camera. So 
very good camera, high sensitivity, uh, great for both planetary and from experience, an excellent guider. So uh, that sensor is made by Aptina. Um, and the sensitivity I was talking about is the quantum efficiency. So it has a very, very good QE, making it uh, both excellent, like I said, for both purposes. Um, another inexpensive starter CMOS camera is, uh, uh, let's see, here we go, uh, ZWO, or ZWO, which is usually used in uh, most situations. They're ASI 120 uh, series, which comes in both mono and color. And the mono uses the same sensor as the QHY, which is the uh, MT9 MO34 by Aptina. But the color version of the ASI 120 is going to be used in Aptina's AR0130 uh, color chip, which we have a uh, video here that uh, Carol sent in to us. So we're going to take a look at that real quick. Over. Okay, so this is the ASI 120 millimeter by uh, ZWO color. Also, a very good sensor. It, um, it's a USB 2.0, uh, 150 degree wide angle lens adapter. Usually comes with it. It's a 1.2 megapixel. QE is about 75%. Uh, shoots up to 250 frames per second at reduced resolution or up to 35 frames per second at full resolution. It uh, does have both an ST4 uh, guider port and it comes with a clear window. And as you can see, Carol here, he's uh, screwing on the telescope adapter, a 125 inch. So yeah, these two cameras are just really great um, for starting off with. I highly recommend. So let's uh, move on. All right, so CCD or charge coupled device came before the CMOS sensor and it detects light across the board or the face and sends it to one corner of the sensor to a register. These cameras typically have the global shutter we were talking about, which allows them to take an image all at once instead of sending it, uh, you know, the way the CMOS was with the rolling shutter, where when you take a picture of a moving object, it's very stuttered. So with a global shutter, any kind of moving objects are not going to show that stutter because the pictures are taken all at once. Uh, CCD images are typically used in cooled and uncooled variations, which allow for long exposure astrophotography. Last episode, we've mentioned two beginner CCD imagers, the Mi DSI series, or Deep Sky Imager, and the Orion G3 Starshoot series, which I have one here. Uh, like I said, we showed this last time, but this is a CCD or charge coupled device sensor in, this, in the center of this much larger sensor than the uh, planetary camera that we showed a minute ago. But um, that's the Orion G3. Both of these cameras are fine cameras, especially for those getting into the hobby. So they're very inexpensive. Um, you know, they're not incredible cameras. You know, you're going to pay big bucks if you're, if you're thinking about, like, the kind of stuff that NASA would take. But um, you can certainly get much better gear if you've got more money. Uh, QHY does make an amazing and affordable line of CCD imagers. Um, if you're looking for more expensive gear that's going to be far better uh, specs, um, they do have both cooled and uncooled and an APC, APS-C or full frame uh, lines as well. The QHY8 Pro uses Sony's ICX 413A QCCD sensor, which only comes in color, but takes the guesswork out of using mono sensors with colors, uh, color filters. ZWO also makes an amazing line of CCD imagers, such as their new ASI 1600, 
which uses a 16 megapixel sensor in both cooled and uncooled versions. Uh, and also both color and mono. For a bit of advice, um, we do suggest uh, you luck on like sites like maybe AliExpress.com if you're hard up for cash. If you want a decent CCD imager, many of the camera and telescope manufacturers outsource their projects to Chinese facilities, and you can get imagers that work just as well, if not sometimes the same ones for half the price. Now, when using CCD imager, which is a mono, like we said before, you got to have an LRGB or luminance, red, green, and blue filters to add color to your image. So let's move on. So, when using your CCD CMOS cameras, you will need computer-based software to control and operate them as they, unlike DSLRs, do not have an onboard processor and memory. So all the process and work and controls are handled by a program on a computer or a PC. Um, and if you saw my uh, tutorial video that I posted on the Facebook group about using wineskin to uh, trick Mac into running Windows programs, like uh, a couple that we're going to mention here in a minute, um, you can use this stuff on MacBook if that's all you have. So. When using CMOS guiders, one of the most popular um, was a free software called PHD Guiding 2. Um, there's really not much to show because I don't have it hooked up. You know, it's, without having it pointed at something worthwhile, there's really no point. But it's pretty cut and dry. You know, whatever um, camera you have, such as the QHY, if you're on Windows, it's automatically on the list so they got a ton of cameras so anyone you buy is probably going to be on there now mac not so much i'm testing something out soon uh with some of these programs so i got phd uh phd the windows version i'm going to see if i can kind of use some of the cameras that weren't on the mac version and i'll um post something about that eventually um so there are other you know guiding and imaging programs that work great with these type of cameras such as nebulosity however this software isn't free now when you use ccd imagers these also must be computer software controlled the uh the images we mentioned earlier uh their software uh, for like the mead dsi series is meads auto star and visage i guess that's the correct uh pronunciation but their stock software for running those cameras their software will allow you to apply custom exposure times, brightness, contrast, gain, uh, and much more. So, and with the Orion G3, like I showed you, that uses the Orion Camera Studio, which basically does the same exact thing. Um, there are paid programs, again, out there that are more elaborate and fancy, but you can easily make do with these two free uh, stock programs that come with their corresponding images. So, you know, let's uh, move on to the next part of this. So one part of the processing with software is uh, you, you're capturing bits and pieces of data and you're probably wondering what to do with all these different images. So when you do astrophotography, typically you do long exposures, you take more than one exposure. Um, so you got like light frames, dark frames, and it all depends on what kind of mount you're using if you're doing long exposures you're going to definitely like we talked about before want to use an eq mount um but when you're when you're taking time exposures which can range from 30 seconds to hours in length uh depending on the limitations of the gear software and user uh, these exposures um are going to collect detail and light and bring out the light that's so dim to the naked eye and it, when you, this process is called stacking when you take your frames and you're using a software that automatically takes the individual frames that you've got overlays them and brings out this hidden light so um stacking you know is pretty well necessary uh there's registacks which i mentioned in my tutorial video for mac um which is mainly for planetary where you take video with a 
you know, planetary cam, just like the QHY. And because planets are so much closer and then the atmosphere has so much disturbance that, you know, it's kind of hard to get a, a long exposure or anything with pictures on a planet. So what they do is you take many frames and Registax is going to take those that video, split it up into individual images and stack the best looking frames. Um, that's pretty cut and dry. Um, with the CCD imagers, you can use uh, Deep Sky Stacker, which I'm going to show you here. Uh, I got a window open, so this is um, Deep Sky Stacker here, and it's pretty simple. You know, you, you got the when you take your frames, you're gonna have light frames, so you're gonna go up and register no open picture files yeah so you're gonna open picture files you're gonna load them in here those are gonna be your light frames and it'll come up right here and you're gonna enter dark files and once you've done all that you register your checked photos then stack check pictures and it's you know without having anything in there i can't really show you but it's pretty simple um cut and dry and to the point so I'm gonna move on from this. Um, one quick mention to uh, now that we've covered covered a couple of these programs, we'd also like to mention that on our Facebook group page, if you join or are already a member, don't hesitate to ask for help or tips from our admins as well as our other members, uh, many of whom are experienced amateur astronomers and astrophotographers. So, you know, there's so much more to astrophotography and far too much to cover in one episode, much less a thousand. And much of the learning process in this hobby is done by trial and error. So, you got to have lots of patience, lots of patience, and lots of patience. Remember to shop cheap first before you invest enough to refinance your mortgage and then decide it isn't for you. We hope these videos are of help to everybody. Um, and we happily welcome suggestions, questions, and comments from our members and viewers alike. Uh, we truly want you to send us your show topic suggestion ideas. Um, and if we use one, we'll give you credit for it. So from here on out, we will be pushing towards making shows based around uh, group discussions, uh, member and professional uh, interviews, and much, much more. You know, we don't want to spill too much, but we appreciate all the support thus far. And we only ask that you like, comment, and share these videos on both your YouTube and Facebook. And help spread BSP and BSS's good names all across this wonderful internet. Uh, so we thank you for watching tonight, uh, tonight's episode. I'm your host Kyle, and we'll see you next time. Good night, and shoot for the stars.